Hello and welcome. I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about Chapter 4, Data Collection, of our course for EEG and ERP for Complementary Alternative and Functional Medicine Practitioners and their patients and, their, and the technicians who perform them. So this is part of a training program for technicians as well as a training program for patients to understand what are we doing and what are we looking for and how can you help make this a better experience for you and get better quality data. So uh, it's all about the data and it's all about the experience. So in data collection, the doctor will always be supervising the collection of an EEG or an ERP in some capacity. They may be in the room, they may be out of the room. There are varying levels of technical expertise of the technicians. Uh, some technicians really know what they're doing and they've been doing it for years and they've seen everything. Some of them are certified and some are not. And uh, there's all levels of technician comfort zone and that's fine. It doesn't affect the patient as long as the doctor is paying attention to uh, the level of, of sophistication of the technician. So what I like to do as the doctor is explain to the patient that, you know, you're going to have this, the technician, I like to tell them their names, introduce them, and say that, you know, I've trained this technician, they're going to be doing this collection with you, and I'm going to be um, in and out as we collect data, and if we have any problems, I'll be here to help. But you shouldn't need me throughout most of it. Now, some patients will require the doctor to sit minute by minute and monitor because they've got lots of artifact that creeps in and there's all kinds of problems. So sometimes, you never really know, but you get inclinations, especially with traumatic brain injury, that someone might be a tough uh, candidate and that they might throw a lot of artifact because of their injuries and consequences of those injuries. So uh, technician collection of EEG data, the technician needs to be working with the doctor. Many times it will be remote where I am in another city and the technician is with another doctor and I am remotely running the EEG or the QEG or, or the um, ERP. And so the technician is capping the patient and putting the electrodes on, but I am monitoring all the electrical activity and, and making the final decisions on, on what is the quality of the data and what has to change. And, um, and that works very well, in fact. Um, we do that quite a lot and um, discovered since COVID that it, it can be really done. And um, with the coordination of offices from state to state, that works very well. Um, doctors, you need to be licensed in both states if you're, if you're doing this in, in a lot of cases, or at least the state of the patient where the patient is located. If you're not in that state, you need to have a state license in that state. If you're doing EEG and ERP kind of stuff, um, you could get in trouble if you're not licensed in the state that the patient resides in. The technician and doctor will, will work together to cap the patient and put the cap on. So um, the technician is going to first measure the patient's head or eyeball. A lot of times they can guess the size of the patient's head and which cap is the most appropriate. Now, there is no hard and fast rule. You can use different size of caps based on the size of hair. Some people have very high hair volume. They've got lots of thick hair and they need a, a bigger cap to accommodate that. Some people have extremely sensitive scalps because of brain injury or other issues and they can't have a tight cap. And so we, we, we give them a larger cap. And this is, this is not a, a big problem because the electrodes need to be within about an inch radius of where the real um, exact 1020 location site is. And the 1020 location convention just has to do with a certain way that we divide up the head based on ratios of where we put these uh, electrodes, based on where their ears are and where the front and back of their head is. And, and so we, we, we divide up the, the head into these different regions. So if you're within an inch radius, um, you're going to be you're going to be close enough in most cases. So the, the most important thing is to make sure that the cap is on that it's pulled down over the head and that it has, um, it's square. We don't want the cap sideways. When you look at the cap, you'll see that there's a seam that goes down the cap like this. And so we wanna make sure that the cap is straight and not skewed sideways. Because if the cap is all one color, it's hard to see. Now there are some caps that have this mohawk color where, where the sides are blue and the top is red or the sides are red and the top is blue. And it's easy to see that the cap is on straight. But the cap is all one color, like yellow, which is the small size for children, or blue, which is one of the larger sizes, or red, which is one of the medium to smaller sizes. These caps, it's, it's not easy for the novice to tell that it's not quite on straight. So you gotta look at the seams and make sure that that cap is on straight and not twisted sideways. When we have put the cap on, we want the hair to be dry. We don't want people to come in with wet hair out of the shower, that's not okay. 
We like to encourage people to not use a lot of hair product. We have had a number of people that come in and forget, and we've found that most of the time the hair product doesn't make that much of a difference, but it can. There are certain conditioners and certain hair products that will really mess up our, um, our caps. And by the way, it's very important to use the right soap if you're cleaning your cap. You can, I, I've messed up caps by using the wrong soap by accident, and you really have to send them back and have them uh, professionally either cleaned or you have to clean them yourself with, with different solutions and, and rinses and alcohol and, and different, different chemicals, uh, or sometimes have the entire cap refurbished and replaced. So make sure you use the right soap that, that is the correct soap for that particular cap by the manufacturer. The next step that the patient will be involved in in the capping process is their ears will have to be cleaned. And so there are several ways to do that. We often use new prep, which is kind of liquid sandpaper. It's green and it's kind of gritty and sandy. And it's, its purpose is to debride the skin and take the, um, the dead skin cells off, like a, like a mini facial for your earlobes. And so you're supposed to, to just use this rough stuff. You could use real sand and, and you could use a, a rough sandpaper. You could use a loofah. You could use any number of things. But the idea is if, you, if you're going to use that from patient to patient, you, you couldn't do that because you're, you're essentially transmitting a bloodborne pathogen if you rough their skin up too much. So you don't really want to um, use the same material and transfer it from patient to patient. Patients can take some of their own. Um, for example, if the new prep bottle is, is clean and it was dispensed onto a clean and dry paper towel and the patient then touch, touches that paper towel, they can rub their own ear. Some doctors do this with their own hand. I don't know that that's the most sanitary, but they will take the new prep, not from the bottle, not from the bottle, but they'll take the new prep and squeeze it down onto a, a piece of paper, and then um, the doctor will use their own finger. That's not so sanitary. Now, if you're wearing a glove, no problem. You can wear a glove and do that. Another procedure that's done very commonly is a Q-tip. You take a long or a short Q-tip, and, and the Q-tip scoops up that little bit of new prep. But only a drop is necessary, and you rub that Q-tip you rub that Q-tip on the ear and clean the ears that way. And then of course, you have to wipe off the ears and make them clean and dry. And I like to use rough paper towel instead of a tissue because the rough paper towel really does clean off the skin. If you were in a pinch, a patient could honestly take a, a, a pinch of sand or a pinch of salt and they could rub their ears and then they could clean their ears with a wet paper towel and then a dry paper towel to get all the sand residue off. The whole idea is we just don't wanna transfer the potential for Debreeding skin could reveal blood cells and, and blood cells could transmit disease from patient to patient. So once we've cleaned the ears, then we're gonna have ear clips of some kind or ear electrodes that will have some paste and the paste will go on the ears and the electrode will go on the ears after they're cleaned. And then we have the electrodes on the cap and those electrodes on the cap will be needing to have some kind of salt water conducting gel. And so that means that the doctor technician will have a barrel and a needle with electro gel liquid and they, they will be putting that into the electrodes and, and just squeezing a tiny amount. You don't need very much. As far as technique goes, I like to tell the patients, you're gonna feel a little bit of coolness because this is room temperature and your scalp is body temperature. So you're gonna feel a little coolness every time we put this in. Then what I do is I like to just minimally fill the, every one of the electrodes and, and then let the head warm up just a tiny bit for a minute or two. Then I like to go back and, and, and um, debride or, or work the needle in back and forth a little bit to move the hair out of the way and, and debride a little bit and sometimes add a touch more uh, fluid and I get very fast capping that way. And since I'm using a brand new needle every time and I'm throwing away that needle into a, into a um, sharps container safely at the end of every session, I don't have to worry about not using a dowel because we can't get a hold of the dowels anymore to get new prep down onto the scalp and, and new prep every site. There are the occasional patients who really do have a lot of exfoliating to do on their scalp, and that happens sometimes. You'll see it in zinc deficient patients. You'll see it in certain B vitamin deficient patients. You'll see it in people that have poor hygiene or don't take care of their scalp very often. You'll see it in people that have eczema of the scalp. Um, that's that's um, not uncommon. You'll see it in people that have scars on their scalp. These are some of the difficulties that happen with capping the patients. Once you have good uh, impedances showing up on the computer screen, then you can move on and, and you've, you've completed capping and, um, and you can move on to actual data collection.